in the absence of anesthetic, I had to do at least to, to stabilize them. We had to clean these wounds. At least it would buy us a few days. And this happened on children and adults? Absolutely, on children, adults. It was, it was one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do in my career. Where do you bury a little boy's leg? This was a question asked by Dr. Hassan Abusitta as he operated on the wounded in Gaza under Israeli bombardment, which has killed over 19,000 Palestinians so far and injured over 52,000 others. You could see the scale was very different. And the scale of the wounding was very different. The scale of, of the kind of killing of multiple generations of the same family was different. And the range of weapons that were being used was different. Following the Hamas-led attack on Israel on the 7th of October, and anticipating what's to come, the British Palestinian doctor arrived in Gaza on the 9th of October, volunteering with Doctors Without Borders. He would operate and tend to the wounded for over 40 days before returning to the UK. When the world failed to rise up to this challenge, the Israelis, the next wave was the destruction of four children's hospitals. Today, we visited Dr. Hassan, who's also an esteemed reconstructive plastic surgeon, in his house in London, where we sat down for a two-part interview to discuss what he saw on the ground. Uh, Dr. Hassan, thank you for coming on Real Talk. I appreciate you. you taking the time. Um, it's been a few weeks since you left Gaza. I just want to get a sense of what's been going through your mind since coming back to London. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, sense of, of guilt about leaving one's patients behind and leaving guilt. one's friends behind and, and colleagues, particularly when you start getting um, you're hearing about friends who've been killed, colleagues who've been killed. Um, two days ago, a friend of mine who's a, an orthopedic surgeon who, with whom I'd worked in Shifa Hospital and at Lauda Hospital was shot by an Israeli sniper while inside Lauda Hospital. Um, there are days when you wonder what happened to specific patients that you left behind. The fact you that still think this, about them, huh? Absolutely. Um, the fact that the, the slaughter is still going on as yeah. we speak, uh, that the hunger is getting worse, and the diseases are getting worse, and the same hospitals are being targeted by the Israelis, whether it's Al Ahli being surrounded again by Israeli tanks yesterday, or Al Auda hospital being shot up by Israeli snipers, it's, it's still ongoing, and so um, rarely does your mind leave uh, Gaza, you're always trying to figure out what happened and, uh, to people that you've left behind. Mm. And what was, what was coming home like, doctor? Coming home to your family, to your, to your children? I mean, what was, what was that like after going through what you went through? For me, th there's a, there's, there was a relief that they no longer had to endure not knowing what would happen to them. Uh, I think especially for my um, family, especially for the kids, just that worry, at least that was over. Uh, from a personal point of view, just the sense that you wanted to do something for the people you've left behind. And so it's just been a kind of roller coaster in which either meetings with uh, um, health uh, NGOs and charities or uh, interviews with, with media outlets to try to kind of um, spread the word about what needs to be done and, and w what the crisis uh, is in Gaza is. Yeah. yeah. You didn't think that you were going to make it, did you? Uh, there are days when I didn't think that that, that was going to happen. Um, the situation had gotten so bleak and the, the targeting of the hospital is so systematic that you really thought that you were going to end up uh, uh, um, um, really not making it out, out of Gaza. Mm. Well, again, I, I thank you for your time. We are spending a bit of tonight together. We're, we're doing a conversation in two parts. We're going to go inside now because it's a bit cold, but we're going to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Thank you. Dr. Hassan, this is not the 
first time that you were in Gaza. I mean, you volunteered, you know, numerous times over the years. But this time around, 2023, you've compared it. You said that what's happening now is like comparing a flood to a tsunami. When we talk about this tsunami, I know it's a broad question, but, but what comes to mind? It's your inability to make an impact as a result of the scale of the wounded and the fact that you've, I mean, on a good day, we would, I would be able to operate on 10 to 12 patients. But each air raid would bring into the hospital between 80 and 150 wounded. And so you felt that you're always on the back foot. You felt that whatever you were doing was minimal compared to the size of the catastrophe that was unfolding. In addition to the fact that every day was just worse than the day before. Every day you had less to work with. Every day there were less hospitals and so the pressure on you was more. And every day you had to make more difficult decisions about who to treat and who not to treat. The idea because of prioritizing. Absolutely. So to, you, when you triage patients based on clinical need and, then, and your capacity, and your capacity continues to diminish and the clinical need continues to increase, your decisions become much more difficult because they're life and death decisions that you're forced to make. Um, at the Ali Hospital, towards the end, we only had two operating rooms and we had over 500 wounded. And so you can imagine the kind of decisions that you would have to make on who to operate on and who not to operate on. Yeah. I mean, earlier in October, before, before the Israeli ground invasion of Gaza, we had uh, the Palestinian ambassador, Hazem Zamlut, on the show. And I asked him what his biggest fear was in Gaza. And he said uh, he fears a second Nakba. Now, after everything that you've witnessed, is this how you would describe it today? That's the intention. I mean, it's obvious that the Israeli uh, war is aimed at two things. Um, through sheer violence and terror, trying to kill as many people as possible, uh, in order to drive as many people out of Gaza as possible. And then the second wave, which will start after the ceasefire, is through turning Gaza into an uninhabitable place, right. through the destruction of um, schools, universities, the whole of the health system, through the wounding of over 50,000 people, through starvation, uh, make Gaza into a place where people are unable to stay, even if they choose to stay. Mm. And, and that with the aim of, of, of really getting rid of Palestinians from Gaza and eventually the West Bank and the Galilee and what's known as the Arab Triangle. You see it as beyond Gaza? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is a frame of mind that the Israeli public has now entered and Israeli institutions, which is the kind of final solution. The solution to the problem with the Palestinians is to um, correct the mistake that they feel the Zionist movement made in 1948, which was not to expel all Palestinians from Palestine and to leave Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Mm. You went into Gaza two days after October 7th. It was the 9th of October. And two days after that, I think it was on the 11th, I, I, I saw an interview where you said that the, the, the power and the weight of, of the, I guess, the destruction um, is already worse than 2014. And this was only two days since you arrived and just a few days since bombing began. I mean, what made you so sure that it was worse than 2014? In 2014, you would see buildings being targeted um, and demolished. In, in this war, you would see whole neighborhoods going up. So you'd be looking out the window and suddenly a neighborhood would go up in flames and then it would turn into a cloud of dust and then it would disappear. And so you could see the scale was very different. And the scale of the wounding was very different. The scale of, of the kind of killing of multiple generations of the same family was different. And the range of weapons that were being used was different. Um, everything from phosphorus to incendiary bombs to fragmentation bombs to 2,000 pound and 
one ton bombs, uh, everything was to drones, to um, drones that had sniper guns on them. Everything was being used with the purely with the aim of killing. You mentioned fragmentation bombs. Were most of the wounds that you were seeing of patients, were they a result of fragmentation bombs? No, you had waves. You had waves, waves. In, which, in which you would see different bombs. So, so initially, it was these explosives, um, these, you know, kind of one ton, 2,000 pound bombs. Then we saw lots of patients with incendiary bombs, you know, bombs that would just create a, a fireball. And we have, would have patients with, you know, large surface area burns with no other injuries. And then we started, see, I mean, I still believe that what was fired on Ahli Hospital was a fragmentation, um, a new generation of Hellfire missile that fragments into discs and creates these massive wounds by amputation. Are we, are we talking about October 17th? The, yes. The bombing of yes, Ahli Hospital, yes. okay. Uh, and then we saw it later on, and we also saw these uh, quadcopter um, drones that, that uh, have sniper uh, guns on them, and they were sent to fire at people trying to reach the hospitals. Yeah. And so, um, and white phosphorus again, I'd seen it in 2009, and it was being used again in, in Gaza now. So, I, I mean, the thing about weapons is, is you, if you've done this long enough, you can tell a lot about the weapon from the wounds, from the physical characteristics of the wounds that they leave behind. And so it's quite feasible to kind of basically tell about the components of the wound, of the weapon and the aim of each weapon. Yeah. Talking about experience and talking about that you've done this, you've been doing this for what, for 30 years now, being volunteering in war zones. And it's, it wasn't just Gaza, it was different countries as well. Um, I guess my question is, is how do you pr prepare yourself for such a mission and when did you start feeling overwhelmed this time around because you clearly see a difference between this time and previous wars that you were involved in i think uh, you prepare yourself um, particularly uh, with the war in Gaza. by i mean there's a kind of mental process you go through yeah where you kind of make a decision that you're going to go because you have something to offer and, and, and it would be wrong for you not to be there. Um, and in terms of this war, yeah. um, really on the first day, so what had happened is on the, on the Monday when I got to Gaza, mm -hmm. uh, I went to my, the family's house, um, my uncle, the great uncle's house, um, and then we had to evacuate within half an hour of getting there. And then we went to someone else's, another cousin's house, where we were pinned down for that whole night. The following morning, the Tuesday morning, when I tried to get to Shifa Hospital, and I walked back to my uncle's house, I saw the scale of the destruction from that one night. I saw these 15-meter craters in the street and whole rows of street uh, where the buildings had been completely demolished. Is this I the realized that you felt like it was different? Absolutely. This was the moment. This was the moment. I knew that it was different. I mean, this was when they targeted the Rimal neighborhood and, and you could see the damage that was being done on a scale that I hadn't seen before. And then what went through your mind then? I mean, do you, do you, do you shift the way you prepare yourself for what's to come? I mean, how, how did you go about it? So I took all of my belongings uh, uh, with me to Shifa Hospital because I knew that for the duration of that war I'd be living inside the hospital, that there would be no possibility of moving around. Um, and you, you kind of get into a different frame of mind. You kind of realize that this is going to be more of a, an attrition war than anything else and, and that you, you prepare yourself for what was to come. But even then, what was to come was much worse than I had thought. Yeah. And you were saying that you were conducting 10 to 12 operations per day during your time there. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you think back to those operations, I, what images come to mind? What, what, what is the most vivid memories, that I guess, that you have from that time? I think just the sheer number of children. I mean, half of the cases were children. Yeah. That is, is what kind of is, is so um, uh, 
difficult to, to kind of comprehend that this was a war on children. You know, they've war killed eight. They've killed ten thousand uh, kids. They've um, wounded and maimed around twenty to twenty-five thousand. There's around a thousand to a thousand five hundred kids with amputations as a result of this war. The this war is 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 being. Uh, um, in addition to many things, a war on Palestinian children. If we go to the night of the Al Ahli bombing, we spoke about it briefly just a minute ago. So October 17th, you were actually there. You spent a lot of the time at Shifa, but during the night that Al Ahli was bombed, you were there. And you said that you were operating and the ceiling fell. Is, can, can you walk me through what the night was like? So what had happened is we were taking one of the patients out of the room in order to get the other one in when this kind of freaking noise from a missile um, and then a huge explosion. And when the, 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 the explosion happened, there's kind of false ceiling in the operating room which fell. Uh, and then when I walked out of the operating room, I could see that the courtyard was on fire and the courtyard of the hospital was just full of bodies. And you realize that there was a direct hit at where, exactly where these families had, who had taken refuge in the hospital were staying. Uh, and just the sheer number of, of dead and wounded around you made you realize that you know, the target was the hospital. Um, by the end of that night, Shifa had received the bodies of 483 uh, killed in, in, uh, in the attack. We could see bodies of children piled up, both dead, not moving, and wounded. There were several who had been amputated. I tended to a man who had his leg blown off at the thigh. We then carried on trying to resuscitate the patient. When the ambulance came, I decided to help out by carrying one of the wounded who had had a shrapnel in his neck into the ambulance. As I was walking towards the ambulance, there were parts of, there were body parts everywhere and there were bodies piled up in the courtyard of the hospital. Yeah. And we saw you, I mean, you took part in the press conference that was, you know, basically surrounded by, by bodies that night. Um, and you were, I, I think you were basically pushed to the forefront because you were a fluent English speaker, is that? Is that and because I had witnessed, I was a, you know, a survivor of, of the attack. Yeah. I mean, you were basically treating patients when you got out in the, into the parking lot, didn't you? Yes. There was someone that you had to tie a belt on. And, I mean, this is, was the difference this time, is that you are, as a, as a doctor, you're in the midst of the attack, and so immediately you're, you're, you have to kind of try to gather yourself uh, from the horror of and, and the kind of shock of what had happened because you're surrounded by people who are dying in front of you. Um, and the first patient had an amputation at the mid-thigh and was bleeding through the stump, and. We had to stop the bleeding, so I used his belt as a tourniquet. Another patient had a piece of shrapnel in his neck and it was bleeding from the, vessel, the blood vessels in his neck and they were spurting out. And all around you there are people dying and people screaming and, 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 and the place was on fire and, and there were parts, dismembered parts of bodies uh, in the courtyard. You know, all of it was just you. You felt that you were in the in the kind of midst of, of this horror show. Yeah. I, is it true that the reason, or not the reason, but your basically your participation in, in the in the press conference was also a way of telling your family that you were still alive? Absolutely. When when I left Al Shifa to take Al Ahli Hospital to take one of the patients out, and I lost my phone in in the kind of you know we were running carrying a stretcher with this patient. The, the you know, my, my surgical scrubs got torn and my fe, fe, phone fell. Um, later on, two days later, discovered that it had fallen in the ambulance and, and the ambulance driver brought it back to Shifa. But 
I all of I could all I could think of was was that I had told my wife that day that I um, I was at Ali Hospital, and I just wanted someone to see me, to tell them that that I was okay. And so when I got to the emergency department at Shifa, I went straight to a um, TV crew belonging to Jazeera. And, and I didn't, it wasn't that I wanted to, to speak to them. I just wanted someone to see me and to let them know. And then the press conference, I hadn't realized the press conference would be carried by every available uh, station. So oh, it was shown. <laughs> it was, yeah. um, and then, you know, that was, yeah, that, I mean, for me, that was the aim. I just wanted them to, to know that I was still alive. I just didn't want my mother to think that I was killed. I didn't want to, uh, my wife and the kids to think that I was killed. Right. Um, I mean, the following days, you've been, you've been dismissive of basically the Israeli claim that this was a, uh, a misfired rocket from, from Gaza. What makes you so sure? So on the day of the, of the attack, um, the medical director of the hospital had come to see us uh, in the operating room. He told us that the Israeli army had called him a few days before and threatened to attack the hospital if he didn't evacuate. And then when he didn't evacuate, the Israelis fired two missiles on the outer perimeter of the hospital. And then the same officer called him back again and berated him about not evacuating. Uh, two, yeah, so he said, I told you that you had to evacuate this hospital uh, and the next time it's not, it's not going to be uh, uh, on the fence. Uh, two, Palestinian missiles have never ever killed 483. They, they're homemade missiles. They don't have that kind of destructive power. Three, when you put this attack in as part of the pattern of attacks on all of the other health system. Why would this be any different? For having been doing this for 30 years, not just as a surgical practitioner, but actually as an academic who researches war injuries, I've written two textbooks on war injuries, I've published over 70 research papers on war injuries. You can tell the kind of of weapon that's being used from the kind of injury that you see in front of you. Um, you can tell whether it's an explosive or it's a fragmentation bomb or if it's an incendiary bomb or it's a bullet, if it's a high velocity bullet or a low velocity bullet, if it's a ricochet or a direct hit. There's a lot you can tell from the injuries and these injuries were not consistent with a missile. Um, and so there, ev everything ar around this uh, attack was did not say that it was a um, an incendiary a, a misfired missile that's uh, you know effectively a homemade missile yeah. when it comes to the israeli targeting of hospitals in gaza like we've seen with al shifa like we've seen with the indonesian hospital i mean did that come to you as a surprise in any way or did you think that that line was going to be crossed eventually I think the attack on the Ahli Hospital was a, was a test by the Israelis to the international community. The Ahli Hospital, as you know, is run by the World Council of Churches. It's, it's managed by the Anglican Church in the UK. Yeah. A bishop sits somewhere in, in London and is the final uh, administrator of the hospital. So if all of the hospitals in Gaza, you'd think a hospital that wouldn't be targeted would be this one. And I think that's exactly why the Israelis chose it. They wanted to see world reaction. And that's why when the world failed to rise up to this challenge, the Israelis, the next wave was the destruction of four children's hospitals. You know, Rantisi, Muhammad al-Durra, Nasr. Uh, yesterday news came that the Israeli tanks have surrounded the Ahli Hospital again. So all of these, you know, there is a systematic destruction of the health system with the aim of making Gaza uninhabitable. And, and the in, medical sector has collapsed, effectively. It has been completely gutted, one piece at a time, t dismantled. And in the south, even those places that have not been physically damaged, the siege has ensured that they don't have the resources to be able to fulfill even a percentage of, of what they need to be able to carry out. Yeah. When you, when you ran out of medical aid, basically all the, the, the resources that you needed, to 
carry out operations to treat patients, you actually had to resort to, to soap and, and vinegar? Is that, is that what you needed to do? From the very beginning, uh, things were running short. I mean, we need to remember Gaza has been under siege for 16 years. And so very early on, because of this, the number of, of wounded, we had to start improvising. Um, I kind of made up this solution of, of um, washing up soap and vinegar and water to clean the wounds. Uh, we were reusing uh, single-use items, so things that are supposed to only be used once and thrown, we would re-sterilize them and use them. And with time, uh, even more critical uh, medication would run out. We ran out of morphine, and so um, the, sur the patients after surgery would only be getting par paracetamol and a non-steroidal rather than morphine, which is what they needed. We ran out of gauze, uh, specialist gauze for burns, so we would basically make them in the operating room by adding Vaseline to gauze. Um, all of these things, we were running out of them. Uh, towards the end, we ran out of anesthetic, and that's what brought the, the whole system to a stop. I mean, for a doctor to run out of anesthetics... You, you start running a, a first aid station. If you can't operate on the wounded, then you just bandage them up and put them in the corner hoping for the best. Again, the, the, did you, before, let's actually take it from the top. So, to run out of anesthetics, right, and to operate on patients on anesthesia, did you have to do that before in other war zones? Never. This is the first time. This is the, absolutely. Never had to run out of anesthetic, never thought that at any stage in my life I and would inflict this And you've been in Yemen, kind of, you've been in Syria, Iraq. I would never have thought that I would inflict pain on people. But, but it, there was no other option. Patients whose wounds had been bandaged for days and weeks were becoming infected, and, and which meant that by the end of the day they would become septic, i.e. the infection would reach the bloodstream and, and they would die. And, and, and in the absence of anesthetic, I had to do at least to, to stabilize them. We had to clean these wounds. At least it would buy us a few days. And this happened on children and adults? Absolutely. On children, adults. It was, it was one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do in my career. Yeah. I mean, doctor, there, there, there's this, as you know, I'm sure, there's this stereotypical view of doctors and people that work in the medical field, that they're able to go on autopilot, right, when they're operating, um, and kind of detach themselves from, from, from any emotional situation. But... Did that wall kind of break for you? I mean, I heard you recount stories about Darin, about Ennis, about Ramadan. Did, did that wall come down? When, when you're a pa parent, it, it, it invariably does come down. Um, while you're in the operating room, you're functioning on autopilot, as you said, but you know, your relationship with these uh, wounded is, is beyond the operating room. You see them and you see their families and you see glimpses of their lives before these lives were shattered. Um, and so you, and, and as a parent, you see your kids in them. You see your 13-year-old. Your Anas was the age of my youngest. Um, and, and, you know, just... Uh, all of them, you, you as a parent, have difficulty detaching yourself. While, and that's why, uh, psychologically, it's easier while you're in the operating room. You, you, just, you're, you, are, you are on autopilot, you're mm. just doing the things that you've been trained to do and you have experience in doing, but in between the cases, when you are seeing these patients, when you're speaking to their families, uh, you're unable to kind of detach yourself to the same extent. What kind of conversations were you striking up with these patients? With kids, you're trying to alleviate their suffering. You're trying to get their minds off what has happened. You're trying to get them to think about other things, more pleasant things in their lives. With the parents, you're trying to give them some hope that their children will eventually lead a semi-normal life, if at all possible. Is there any specific conversation that has stuck with you? My last conversation with Anas was about football. Um, he had, we'd just finished his second surgery. 
uh, and he there's a part of the operating room called the recovery room where you kind of just to make sure that patients have woken up from the anesthetic and he had been thirsty and, and asked for water and I went and got him a bottle of water and, and I was giving him the water to drink slowly because you don't want him to choke. And then I started asking him about his, his favourite football team and, and about football and, um, and, and you know, until he, he, he was taken back to the wards and it was the last time I saw him. A couple of days later he, he passed away. Passed away. And what was his wound? He had over 60% of his body burnt by an incendiary bomb. Full thickness burns throughout his face, hands, lower limbs. I'm sorry to, to be asking you this, doctor. I, I know how hard it is, but... Basically, what I'm trying to get at is was it because that you're a parent that you found it so difficult operating on these kids, or was it because of the situation? I think it adds a dimension to, to um, your relationship with children, because I do remember that it was different before I had my children. I mean, I worked in Gaza during the first and second intifada, and before the, the kids were born. And that doesn't mean that you were completely callous, but there's a kind of level of you know, sympathy that you have for the suffering of their parents. Um, that, right, that because that's another them. layer, Absolutely. dealing with the parents as they're seeing their, their kids being treated as well. Um, so it does, it just, it adds another dimension. Yeah. You have difficulty trying to detach yourself from that. Yeah. In 2003, you also said something during an interview that struck me. Um, you said that these people are going to be shot at again, their homes demolished. What we do is treat the symptoms, the disease is the occupation. So that was 20 years ago. Absolutely. Where are we today? We're now at the point where that disease has become fatal. And um, that kind of logic of elimination, which determines the relationship between the native and the colonial settler, has reached its genocidal conclusion. And that is your... Belief. Absolutely. We're, we have nowhere else to go now. Either that they do wipe us out, like they did with the Native Americans and the Aborigines, and uh, every other um, Native um, uh, that European settlers colonized, or, or we rise up and, and we are able to regain our um, humanity. On that note, Doctor, I mean, we are going to continue the conversation. This is the end of part one. We will talk about more things in part two, but I thank you for, for taking some thank time you. to speak to us today. Thank you very thank much. You, Dr. Thank you. There is a very rich history of, uh, within the Palestinian story of the role of health and the provision of health as part of the kind of Palestinian um, national liberation struggle.